Judge Gretney, thank you for already introducing him as simply the legend. <clears throat> Your Honors, thank you. It's always a privilege to be here at the Robert H. Jackson Federal Courthouse. And you might ask, why is our next speaker a legend? Well, he was uh, the re is now the retired dean of the St. Bonaventure Journalism, Journalism School, uh, which from 1996 to 2011 he held. He was most recently inducted into the Buffalo Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. Why did that happen? He's got a quite an incredible career. <clears throat> he graduated from St. Bonaventure University, uh, Gobanis, uh, 1964. He was in the military for two and a half years. Came back and work was hired in 1967 by the Buffalo News. His articles on organized crime and the Witness Protection Program actually were the inspiration for a 1980 movie called Hide in Plain Sight. I suspect none of you probably here in this audience saw that, but you have, right? Okay. <laughs> and I suspect uh, when Judge Martocci gets her, she can talk about her dad as well. Um, <clears throat> Lee Capolo left the newspaper after 16 years to pursue a career in TV journalism. In 1983, he was hired as a troubleshooter for WKBW TV's Eyewitness News and later served as investigative reporter uh, at another WIVB. <clears throat> he then went on to do something which is incredible. He just decided to go into law school, which is great. He'd seen the other side, and then he decided to go and become a lawyer. So he graduated from the University of Buffalo Law School. He was a U.S. attorney from 1992 through 1996, and then had an incredibly distinguished career at his alma mater at St. Bonaventure, uh, leading that school of journalism. Uh, I could go on, but his, he, he's well worth listening to because his experiences are vast and many. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Coppola. Good morning. One correction, I was an assistant United States attorney. I think Dennis Vaca would get very upset if he found out I was the U.S. attorney. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about protests and protests that I have uh, in my career as a journalist covered. So I'm going to bring you back 45 years ago this week. I was standing outside the walls of a place called Attica Correctional Facility in Attica, New York. It was a dark and dreary day, it was raining, and I was there with a whole bunch of reporters from around the world. We were covering what was called the Attica Revolt. Prisoners had taken over the prison, inmates had taken over the prison four days prior to that. They were protesting. They were protesting the fact that they were not getting the sufficient food. They were protesting the fact that the conditions there were deplorable. They were protesting the fact that they were not uh, accustomed to the kind of, well, of course, they were not accustomed to the kind of treatment they were given by corrections officers. Uh, they weren't getting proper medical attention. And, and as an aside, a majority of the prisoners were either Latino or black. A vast majority of the corrections officers were white. So it was a racial antagonism that was there behind the walls. All right, so I'm standing outside because we had been told that this was the day the state was going to retake the prison. And I'm standing outside and I'm watching heavily armed corrections officers, state troopers, sheriff's deputies walk into the prison with rifles and shotguns and I'm wondering what is going to happen next. Well, what happened next was a helicopter appeared above the prison yard and started circling. And from the helicopter, a bullhorn, a voice going, put down your weapons. Put down your weapons, release the hostages. Because the prisoners, when they took over the prison, took control of the prison and also captured hostages. Release the hostages. And then, all of a sudden, tear gas canisters were being dropped from the helicopter. And as the tear gas wafted over the walls of Attica, those on the other side, myself included, the tears coming down from the tear gas, and I don't know if it was a tear gas, I started hearing the gunfire. 
those heavily armed officers inside the prison were shooting at the prisoners. And they were shooting heavily, uh, they were shooting rifles and they were shooting uh, shotguns. And it was like firecrackers going off. Pop, 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 pop. And it lasted for like six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. And I'm standing there wondering what in the world is happening. The prisoners had no weapons other than homemade knives. They had no guns. The only weapons were in the hands of the law enforcement people. It turned out that that day, 39 people were killed. 10 of them were hostages and 29 were prisoners. It turned out that that day, many of them were killed after they surrendered because of the anger and the antagonism and the animosity on the, charge of the, on the part of those who were in the charge of the prison. All right, let's talk about it now. That was a protest. It was really an illegal protest. Prisoners aren't supposed to take over a prison, but they had no other alternative in their minds. They had to show that the conditions inside that prison were deplorable. They had to show that we can't live like this anymore. So they took control of the place where they lived. It's illegal, you're not supposed to do that. But also the retaking of the prison, the publicity that that entire uprising and the bloody rebellion that it was, changed things in American penal systems. Penal authorities recognized that you can't have predominantly white corrections officers administering and guarding predominantly people of color. So that's changed considerably throughout the United States. Specifically at Attica, all of a sudden, medical conditions improved tremendously. More guards were hired, and they weren't just hired from the surrounding rural community, they were hired from New York City and metropolitan areas so they could understand the culture of the inmates better, because that was a discord between corrections officers and the inmates. You know, Judge Scretney talked about when he was in college in 1969. In 1965, uh, I went into the Army, as, uh, as Greg told you, and I was a, uh, an officer at a place called White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. At that time in American history, there was a, a thing going on in a country called Vietnam called a skirmish at the time, a kind of a war. And my job, one of my jobs at White Sands Missile Range was to talk to new recruits and to give them a pep talk because they were on their way to this war zone in Vietnam. And I would tell them how important it was and how vital it was for them to go and defend America. And they would off, go off to Vietnam and I don't know how many of them never came back. I have no idea. But I know when I left the Army and I went back to Buffalo and I was hired on a newspaper, protests were erupting throughout the country. Protests mostly on college campuses. Young men and young women, a couple years older than you are here, were protesting because they felt this was an unjust war. And you know, as I watched those protests, and most of them were peaceful, some of them, some of them resulted in death. There was a place called Kent State. Four college students were killed by National Guardsmen because they were conducting what was their right to protest peacefully against a war they felt was unjust. And those protests changed my mind about that war. And I said, you know, this war was wrong. And I regretted standing in front of those bright-eyed soldiers and telling them how important it was to go off to Vietnam and to fight. I regretted that because I realized that it was wrong. And I realized it because of the protesters. And because of those protesters, because of those peaceful protests throughout the United States, the government also recognized that it was wrong and eventually found a way to get out of Vietnam. So protests can produce results. Protests are powerful. I don't know if Colin Kaepernick's protest will be result in anything, but he's shedding a light, he's shedding a spotlight on an issue he feels is important in the United States. So remember that they can mean something, they can promote change, 
They can instill people's minds with ideas that maybe people didn't have before or opinions or views that people didn't have before. And in about a half an hour, by the way, there's going to be a peaceful protest at UB because they're protesting the fact that the government is considering allowing a oil pipeline to run through North Dakota's Native American lands. So even here in our community in a half an hour, there's going to be a peaceful protest because some people oppose an oil pipeline going through a state on Indian lands. Thank you all very much. I mean, Lee Coppola, uh, I mean, you couldn't have done any better in terms of bringing reality uh, to all of us and maybe inspiring us to think through a little bit better and a little bit more profound these key issues that are simple in many respects. But the more knowledgeable we become, the more likely we'll be, or more unlikely that it will be, that we'll be taken down the wrong path. We want to do what's right. We don't want to do what's wrong.